It's such a pleasure to see you all on this first work day of the summer. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> I can understand that the dream of the 18th century philosophers, to me beautiful, is not for everyone. I personally like the universe. They took over from Spinoza, regular, orderly, and above all comprehensible by the rationality that the divine artificer gave mankind before absconding from his creation. By using that God-given reason, the philosophes thought, we can find out those laws of nature ordained by the creator, including the laws of our own human nature, and we can fashion and ultimately perfect our behavior, our morals, our society, and our laws according to it. As much as I love it, I understand that this is, at least in part, only an intoxicating vision. And I understand why doubt so quickly set in. As Joseph Addison rightly conceded as early as 1712, the music of the spheres is not a real music, but one only audible to reason's ear alone. Little wonder that the reign of feeling is distinct from reason so quickly asserted itself that, me that men began to boast of their sensibility and cry in public as an outward sign of inner fineness of sentiment. After all, people were right to say that there are other ways than reason through which we know about the world and ourselves. There is intuition, there is sympathy, there is even romantic mysticism, and more. After the terror at the end of the 18th century, had shown how much devouring unreason the republic of reason could itself unleash, it's even comprehensible how interest turned all the more to the occult and supernatural, to mesmerism and visions like Coleridge's opium dream of a damsel with a dulcimer. But even granting the further rationalist terrors that visited the world, most recently, a modern nation setting up a fully bureaucratized industry for exterminating an entire people, or an archipelago of intellectuals, reason's guardians, proselytizing for a crackpot theory of reason working in history that served to kill millions and enslave more, even granting all this, how did we moderns ever turn from reason to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> How did we ever come to think that there was an ecstatic and wise higher consciousness reachable through what is rightly called dope? <laughs> or that transgression in such a state is somehow mitigated? I don't have a high enough consciousness to get it. Like Aristotle, I prosaically believe that one who transgresses under the influence of a mind-altering substance is doubly guilty, not only of the crime, but also of dispossessing himself of the reasoning power that inhibits crime. To explain these mysteries, I call upon my dear friend and colleague Theodore Dalrymple, who, behind that increasingly famous nom de plume, is a recently retired British doctor named Anthony Daniels, a City Journal contributing editor and the Dietrich Weissman Fellow of the Manhattan Institute. Tony is the author of the just released Romancing Opiates, a wise, engaging, and fascinating book that sheds brilliant light on the myths and realities surrounding modern drug use. As a psychiatrist in a slum ward specializing in drug overdoses, and as a GP in a prison filled with addicts, Tony brings a wealth of hard evidence to this task. But Tony's firm grounding in real experience, in real experience isn't this book's only signal advantage. It also benefits from the wide reading and profound thinking that have made Tony, as evidenced by his two previous books of City Journal essays, life at the bottom, and our culture, what's left of it. 
the finest literary and cultural critic, as well as the foremost social commentator of our age, Tony Daniels. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's always a great pleasure to come to New York. Uh, but even if it weren't, I'd come every year just to hear Myron say these things about me. <laughs> of course, I wouldn't take them seriously unless he uh, uh, were the editor of the uh, uniquely excellent uh, City Journal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my uh, subject today is opiate addiction and the way that it has been misconceived for nearly two centuries. And the subject, while of perpetual interest, is not perhaps of the first importance when it comes to our, uh, the problems that our society uh, faces. Uh, but it's an interesting and perhaps uh, emblematic example of how error may become ingrained and how the most obvious facts uh, may be ignored and uh, their significance overlooked entirely. It's my contention that uh, most of what people think they know about addiction, I'm talking about the man in the street, of course, um, uh, and other opiates is not only wrong, but obviously wrong. Uh, perhaps I can best illustrate this by uh, giving in outline what I think most people uh, believe about heroin addiction and then uh, pointing out the errors uh, that it contains. According to what one might call the orthodox or official version, a person somehow or other uh, comes into contact uh, almost at random with heroin, which he is deceived into taking uh, without knowing what he is getting himself into. Uh, he finds it pleasurable and takes it a few times. Uh, and then he is uh, hooked on it, as the expression goes so that if he tries to stop taking it, he suffers the most horrible, the most agonizing and terrible withdrawal symptoms uh, which no person uh, could reasonably be expected to undergo of his own volition. He therefore has no choice but to continue. Unfortunately, however, his habit destroys his ability to work and he therefore resorts to crime in order to pay for the heroin that he must now uh, take. All is not quite hopeless or lost, however, because treatment uh, is available, if only it will make itself available uh, to the addict. And this treatment consists largely of prescribing drugs of a similar but not identical kind to the heroin addict uh, that he is already taking. If, but only if, he has the right treatment, he can abandon his habit. Now all of this is nonsense, and obvious nonsense. To suggest that the average uh, heroin addict in our inner cities has no idea about heroin before he starts taking it, it is, is to display an abject uh, ignorance of the social conditions uh, prevailing in our cities. When young addicts used to say to me by way of explanation of their habit uh, that they fell in with the wrong crowd, I uh, used always to reply that it was remarkable how I met large numbers of people who had fallen in with the wrong crowd, but I never met any members of the wrong crowd itself. <laughs> <laughs> and though these addicts uh, were neither very well educated nor even particularly intelligent, I never met a single one who didn't start laughing. And their laughter meant, of course, that they entirely understood the point that I was trying to make. People who are given opiates after operations, sometimes for days, do not become op addicts in the sense that uh, I'm talking about. Moreover, it's been shown that heroin addicts have to make considerable efforts, in other words, to be determined to become addicts and addicted. And on average, it takes them about a year or so. In other words, heroin does not hook them, they hook heroin. And this, I venture to suggest, is a typical example of the way that when we think about social problems, or many, the way many of us think about social problems, we ascribe agency not to agents, but to inanimate objects and substances and forces. Well, having hooked himself to heroin, the addict will get the most terrible illness if he tries to stop taking it. That's the doctrine, and it's pharmacological nonsense. The withdrawal symptoms from opiates are not severe uh, and never dangerous, though, of course, they do exist. Insofar as they are genuinely feared, it is because there has been a campaign of exaggeration about them for nearly 200 years. 
there is decisive evidence that the suffering of withdrawal, such as it is, is largely of psychological origin, and that psychology originates with lies and misunderstandings. Moreover, it is a matter of uh, common clinical observation that addicts exaggerate their symptoms for their own obvious ends, namely to induce doctors to prescribe. Well, what about uh, crime and addiction? Is it not the case that addicts, in the words of one uh, British liberal commentator who advocated uh, free heroin for everyone who wanted it, that they have to rob and steal to maintain their habit? Insofar as there is a causative relationship between addiction and crime, it is that a disposition towards criminality causes addiction and not addiction that causes criminality. Of a hundred addicts, for example, whom I interviewed on their entry into the prison in which I worked in England, 67 had been to prison before they ever took heroin. When you consider that in order nowadays to get into prison in Britain, you have to be convicted about 10 times. <laughs> and furthermore, that to be convicted once, you have to commit between five and 20 crimes, at least if you're an averagely competent uh, British criminal pursued by an averagely incompetent British police force, it follows that of 100 addicts, 67 had committed between 50 and 200 crimes before they uh, took heroin the first time. Uh, the other 33 had probably not been caught. I, I actually asked them the wrong questions. But in any case, my findings are not new. These are old uh, findings. The career, if that is what it was, of the writer William Burroughs illustrates this perfectly. Burroughs was a natural-born criminal who, who happened to come from a privileged background. He went to Harvard, but according to his own account, nothing in Western or indeed in any other civilization uh, interested him as much as the life of crime. He spent his time on leaving Harvard, for a time anyway, going through the pockets and stealing the small change of drunks on the New York subway system, and that's before he ever took heroin, which I think you will agree is not the sign of a refined moral sensibility. <laughs> And though he despised his family and their money, uh, they both came in rather handy to get him out of prison in Mexico after he murdered his wife there, a crime that had nothing whatever to do with the consumption of heroin. Uh, Burroughs' first book, Junk, subsequently uh, republished as Junkie, is uh, unconsciously revealing and instructive. Burroughs tells us that the addicts with whom he associated called doctors who prescribed the drugs they demanded, he, they called them writing croakers, not a term either of respect or affection, uh, but one of contempt uh, for their naivety or for their dishonesty. He also tells us that his own withdrawal symptoms, described in lurid terms, were relieved by antihistamines, which is con confirmation that they were largely of psychological origin, since there's no pharmacological reason why antihistamines, other than by their mildly tranquilizing effect, should have relieved them. Well, what of the need of medical assistance for addicts uh, to cease taking heroin? Let me uh, preface my uh, remark by quoting a philosophical principle which I think comes from Aristotle, though I may be mistaken in this and I'm open to correction. Uh, and this principle is that whatever happens must be possible. And the fact is that millions of opiate addicts have given up their habit without medical assistance. I'm not an admirer, to put it mildly, of Mao Zedong, uh, but he was without question the greatest therapy of, uh, a therapist of opiate addicts in the history of the world, and he's the greatest therapist the world will ever see. When he came to power, he... Uh, told 20 million or uh, so opium smokers in his own inimitable fashion that if they didn't give up, it would be the worst for them. And lo and behold, they did give up. No other treatment was necessary. Now, it clearly wouldn't have made much sense for Mao similarly to have threatened consumptives uh, that with the similar treatment if they didn't stop coughing up blood. And this suggests to me, at least, that there is a difference, a conceptual difference, between a real illness like tuberculosis and what is fundamentally self-infliction, albeit one with medical consequences. 
Incidentally, many thousands of American uh, servicemen addicted themselves to heroin in Vietnam, but two years after their repatriation, their rate of addiction was no greater than that of draftees who would go to Vietnam, uh, but never did go because the war had ended. So why, ladies and gentlemen, have these most obvious and salient facts been overlooked and their significance also? They're to be found in all the textbooks. In the first place, to overlook them is in the interests, at least in the short-term interests, of those addicts themselves who wish uh, for a rationalization of their decision to continue taking drugs and to be regarded as ill or victims rather than as having made bad choices. It is also in the interest of a small but significant group of people who have devoted their lives and careers to uh, the so-called care of drug addicts and who in effect need the addicts far more than the addicts need them. <laughs> These people need to see uh, their, uh, their wards as uh, victims, not as agents. And they also accept the modern prejudice that uh, in order for someone to display any sympathy, understanding and compassion for someone in an unfortunate situation, it is necessary to accept uncritically that man's account of his own sufferings. But in my view, there's a uh, deeper uh, historical reason why such obvious truths about the subject should have prevailed, and that is that they are embodied in a powerful and unbroken literary tradition uh, dating back to the English romantics of the early 19th century, particularly, of course, to Quincy and Coleridge. Now, Coleridge, of course, wrote in a self-dramatizing uh, prose style in which it's quite impossible to tell the truth about anything. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in any case, he was a most frightful liar about his conduct uh, and was frequently uh, scheming and dishonorable. But it was more especially uh, de Quincey's famous book, The Confessions of an English Opium Eater, that uh, started the whole downward spiral into preposterous obfuscation, evasion, self-pity, and implicit self-glorification. Uh, the literary tradition has been unbroken ever since. When Edgar Allan Poe and Charles Dickens wrote about opium dreams, they lifted their symbolism straight out of de Quincey. Baudelaire, of course, translated uh, de Quincey and inaugurated, inaugurated a long French literary tradition of claptrap about opiates. De Quincey had his American imitators also, who repeated what he wrote more or less faithfully. And the dramatization of what, in effect, was a sordid little personal habit has continued ever since, uninterrupted and repeated in novel and film from Cocteau and Alastair Crowley to Nelson Algren, uh, you probably remember the man uh, with the golden arm, and Irving uh, Walsh of Trainspotting. It was de Quincey who started the search for the buried psychological treasure that explained and, of course, justified opium addiction and first invested it with special transcendent intellectual and emotional effects, claiming that it opened up to people realms that non-takers of opium could not imagine, and also claiming that only those with experience of opium had the right to speak about it. He claimed, in fact, to be the pope of the Church of Opium. Addicts to this day claim that they are the only people qualified to speak of the seriousness of withdrawal effects, as if only people with cerebral malaria or bowel cancer could speak of their seriousness. Opium, says De Quincey, introduces among me mental faculties the most exquisite order, legislation, and harmony, though he gives no concrete uh, example of this exquisite order, legislation, and harmony. Well, it's um, characteristic of successful false prophets that they should have an intoxicating style. And in the most famous uh, passage in the uh, book, uh, De Quincey says, uh, I'll just uh, find it here. Oh, just, subtle, and all-conquering opium, that to the hearts of rich and poor alike, for the wounds that will never heal, and for the pangs of grief that tempt the spirit to rebel, bringest an assuaging balm, eloquent opium, that with thy potent rhetoric stealest away the purposes of wrath, pleadest effectual, uh, effectually uh, for relenting pity, and through one night's heavenly sleep callest back to the guilty man the visions of his infancy, and hands washed pure from blood, O just and righteous opium, 
that, the trans that to the chancery of dreams summonest for the triumphs of despairing in innocence, false witnesses and confoundest perjury, and dost reverse the sentences of unrighteous judges. Thou buildest upon the bosom of darkness out of the fantastic imagery of the brain, cities and temples beyond the art of Phidias and Praxiteles, beyond the splendors of Babylon and Hecatompylos. And from the anarchy of dreaming sleep callest into sunny light the faces of long buried beauties and the blessed household countenances cleansed from the dishonors of the grave. Thou only givest these gifts to man, and thou hast the keys of paradise, O just, subtle, and mighty opium. All bilge, of course. <laughs> and eloquent, but bilge. And all the lies and evasions of present-day heroin addicts uh, are present in De Quincey and they have been re uh, repeated uh, uncritically ever since in books and stories, even by literary doctors such as Leon Daudet and Mikhail uh, Bulgakov. De Quincey tells us that he quite literally could do no other than become an addict, not in Luther's moral sense of being unable to do other than he did, but that he was quite literally not, it was not within his power to refrain from taking opium. He talks of chains and slavery, a metaphor that has been used ever since for 180 years. And uh, actually, if I ever read another book that talks about chains and slavery, well, like Violet Elizabeth, a character in the in English children's uh, book called William, Just William, I'll scream and scream and scream <laughs> until I'm thick. I can, you know. Well, De Quincey is the originator of the exaggeration of the pains of withdrawal. And he, uh, and it is he who invests uh, the stopping of opium with the aura of a titanic struggle. That's what he called it, a titanic struggle. And this is uh, six years after the Battle of Waterloo, uh, thus inaugurating a tendency uh, to self-obsession. Uh, this is how he describes himself four months, four months after he has allegedly stopped, uh, stopped taking opium. Think of me as one still agitated, writhing, throbbing, palpitating, shattered, and much perhaps in the position of one who had been racked, that is, put on the rack, as I uh, recollect the torment state from the affecting account of them left by a most innocent sufferer in the times of James I. Of course, de Quincey is writing nonsense from the pharmacological point of view, but in this instance, literature has uh, uh, decisively triumphed over pharmacology in its effect on public consciousness and uh, continues to do so, in my view. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, my time's up. Let me just finish by saying that uh, I've long tried to find a reason to think that literature uh, can do as good, good in the moral sense. Uh, so far, however, I can only find uh, good evidence that it can do us harm and uh, induce undoubted misunderstanding of a social problem. Thank you very much. Would you compare uh, the level of discomfort that a drug addict might uh, experience coming off to someone who's been a, a smoker for years? We hear the same things about people who cannot stop smoking. Yes. Uh, I, I suppose it's of a, a similar kind of order. Actually, it's often um, the worst uh, that uh, withdrawal from opiates. It's often compared with a bout of flu. Though this is an absurd comparison since uh, an epidemic of flu uh, kills about 20,000 people in the United States. So, um, uh, but that is the, that's the kind of level of suffering uh, that, at its worst, it produces. Um, <clears throat> would your comparison of how you see opiate addiction, the opiate addict, not necessarily needing treatment, he or she could recover by themselves, 
to take another drug, alcohol or alcoholism, which has probably even more literary writing about it, has withdrawal. At least the health profession in America says that withdrawal could be deadly. Would, that, would you also say that the alcoholic, he or she, could recover by themselves? They don't need treatment? Uh, well, first of all, of course, withdrawal from alcohol is a medically very serious or potentially very serious uh, condition. And uh, the textbooks say that between 5 and 10% of people who have delirium tremens will die uh, without treatment. Well, I've never seen deaths from uh, delirium tremens because the ones that I've seen have been treated. So, uh, so I think the comparison is... Um, it is not right. I mean, and actually, you can get delirium tremens from withdrawal from, uh, or something very similar to it, from withdrawal from uh, benzodiazepines, for example. So it, I, I, I'm not saying that there is no instance in which withdrawal is not serious. It depends very much uh, on what the substance is. One very interesting phenomenon to me is the fact that in prison, in Britain anyway, uh, all concentration was on the drug addicts, and nobody uh, took any notice of uh, the alcoholics who were actually uh, in the throes of delirium tremens, which is a dangerous condition. There was no official interest in it. Uh, I think al alcoholics can give up. I'm not actually against um, uh, people, for example, going into rehabilitation, provided it's understood that this is not really a, a medical procedure. Often what happens is that people who are addicted to a substance, uh, alcohol or opiates, have uh, comprehensively messed up their lives. And uh, since life is a biography and not just a series of unconnected moments, it may be that they require some assistance in getting their lives together, but that, I don't regard that as really a medical uh, procedure. Uh, at least some American mental health professionals uh, state that addiction is a disease. Uh, how do you respond to that assertion? Um, well, I... I I mean, the, the fact is, of course, that there are physical correlates of addiction that one can't deny. Uh, so um, I don't deny that, that, those, that those correlates exist. But I think if it is a disease, the actual disease aspects of it are so trivial by comparison with the other aspects of the, uh, of the, of the condition, if that's what you want to call it, uh, that uh, they are of very little account. Hi. Um, I recall reading that the mother of the playwright Eugene O'Neill uh, was an opiate addict for most of her 40 years of marriage and that within six weeks of her husband's death she no longer was using opiates. Uh, maybe that's an argument for liberalized divorce laws, uh, but back then opiates were legal and she could obtain them. Now she could not do so. What is the harm in having somebody like Eugene O'Neill's mother uh, taking opiates, if that is to use the vernacular, it helps her get through the day. Uh, well, uh, as far as I understood, it, uh, Eugene O'Neill wasn't very keen on his mother, but I might, uh, <laughs> uh, I might be mistaken there. Um, I, I, the, 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 uh, the question of legalization always comes up, and I'm not quite sure what people mean by legalization, because, of course, there are different uh, possible uh, ways of legalizing things. Uh, but, in fact, I don't think it will have the advantages uh, claimed for it at any rate. Even if it doesn't lead to disaster, it won't have the uh, advantages claimed for it. <clears throat> I just came back from Amsterdam, uh, and I love the coffee houses there because they always have a sofa in the front window and two or three people uh, lying back smoking uh, uh, reefers. Uh, and this is really a follow-up from what was just asked. If every, they more or less make marijuana perfectly legal, um, I don't think taking cocaine uh, is legal, but it's certainly not discouraged. Yeah. Um, do, how much danger would there be since if it's all legalized, and let's say you can get it at the coffee house the way you can in Amsterdam, um, what, how much danger is there of just populace saying, well, it's legal, uh, why not give it a go? 
Well, Amsterdam uh, is actually a very violent city. It's uh, the second most violent city, I believe, in, in, in Europe, after, of course, London. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and actually the legalization of the de facto legalization, because it's only a de facto legalization, it's not a real uh, legalization, has produced very odd things happening in, in uh, Holland. I, uh, I was taken recently, I, I, I've also just come back from Amsterdam, and not long ago I gave a little talk at the Ministry of Justice there, and one of the officials uh, came to me and pointed out a um, housing project that you could see from the Ministry of Justice in The Hague. And it's, uh, everyone in this housing estate was unemployed and getting their 1,200 or 1,500 euros a month for doing nothing. Um, but they didn't do nothing. They were growing um, uh, uh, cannabis, actually. And uh, they were making about five or 6,000 uh, euros a month uh, growing cannabis, uh, uninterrupted in general by the Dutch police. And so what was happening now is that these people had absolutely no incentive whatever to go and work because, of course, they couldn't do anything anyway and um, that anyone would pay them much for. So there was no prospect of them uh, earning, um, uh, going to work. Um, now, you could say, well, if everyone just grew cannabis, the price would fall and therefore they wouldn't uh, earn... Uh, uh, earn uh, uh, 6,000 euros a month or 5,000 or whatever it was. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, I, I'm not sure that it would be catastrophic, but I'm not sure either that it would have the enormous benefits. The fact is that the consumption of alcohol, certainly, in, within societies does have some um, relation to its price. So that if the price goes up, the consumption goes down, and vice versa, of course. And if one of the prices or is, is, um, uh, is that you might get chased by the police, uh, it probably does deter people. But I can, I, I can quite see, I can see the argument, but I don't think it'll have the benefits the claimed. If my argument is right, and that people take, I'm talking about opiates now, if people take, if they take opiates more because they're criminal than they're criminal because they take opiates, uh, then criminality, uh, the criminality would not be reduced by uh, legalizing it. And furthermore, with regard to the drug dealers, I don't believe that they would uh, uh, turn their, beat their guns into uh, plowshares, and uh, then they might turn them uh, on people other than other drug dealers. And I, this is actually quite a serious point because uh, in my hospital, we, uh, when I started there, we didn't have any gunshot wounds, and then we became expert in treating gunshot wounds, but we knew that everyone being shot was a drug dealer by other drug dealers. Thank you for that talk. I found it very encouraging. Sigmund Freud writes a great deal about man's need to escape and points out uh, alcohol, opiates, uh, movies, work. Have you analyzed why the need is so great? man's need to escape is so great? Uh, yes, well, I feel it myself. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, my life has been one long escape, really. <laughs> um, I uh, think the existential position of the drug addicts that I see is an absolutely terrible one. Um, and it's a problem in our society. It's a serious problem because here are people who uh, actually um, have no religious belief. They have no culture in the sense of anything that they do themselves. Um, their economic prospects are very slight. They have no intellectual, cultural interests. And furthermore, they have no struggle for existence in the sense that in our societies you just can't starve to death without actually deciding, you just cannot do it. It's impossible. And what's more, you can't really, unless you go at it very uh, hard, become homeless either. So there's no pride as there was that I saw when I lived in Africa 
in, uh, in um, survival. So what is left for these people? And, and, uh, and I think the kind of oblivion, what one can say is kind, uh, a kind of uh, oceanic feeling followed by oblivion induced by opiates is quite likely a, a good alternative for these people. And one of the things that alarms me about the uh, young English, of course I know people have been saying this for 2,500 years, uh, but this time it's true, um, <laughs> is that uh, I, I hear them talking and they talk about the wonderful evening they had before uh, because they can't remember anything about it. <laughs> so the fact that they can't remember anything about it means that it's a good a wonderful time which makes you wonder what it is, um, what their lives actually are. So I think that's a very serious question. Uh, but I think in a, a modern uh, welfare state, for very large numbers of people, there is no answer. And that, that, that is the real reason why we have people resorting more and more uh, to, um, to drugs and uh, alcohol. Hi. I realize your focus is on opiates. But on the other hand, as somebody has already pointed out, alcohol addiction is enormous. Plus, of course, we have methamphetamine and cocaine. So I'm trying to get a better understanding of your views on the uh, addiction bureaucracy, the treatment field, particularly as it pertains to these other chemicals that are much more devastating, and especially with young people, teenagers who are more vulnerable, it seems to me, to the hard, harder drugs and more vulnerable to going the wrong way in so many different ways. So what is your take on the addiction bureaucracy and do you feel there are certain types of addiction treatment that might be more effective? I think it's extremely unlikely that uh, any treatment, any attempt to deal with these problems in a purely technical fashion is going to work because the problem is not a technical one. I have no solution. I can't tell you what my solution is. I mean, I think actually uh, uh, probably a reversal of the welfare state would actually have some benefit, but I don't think I'm going to persuade many people of that, at least in England. Um, so, uh, but I don't think that a purely technical approach to these questions is, is going to help. I, as I said, I have no objection whatever to people going into rehabilitation because, uh, provided one doesn't think of it as a medical procedure, because the fact is that people have often for a very long time made such a terrible mess of their lives that getting them back to some kind of uh, uh, decent way of uh, life is not the work of a moment. It, it's impossible. You, and, and, for example, I have seen this often. We dry out alcoholics and so on and uh, they've alienated everyone in their family and they've uh, had a, they've ruined their careers and so on and they're 53 and uh, they come they come out of their alcoholic haze and they look around and they see the devastation around them and they say well if that's what life is I might as well drink and there comes a point at which you say well I, I really can't recommend much else <laughs> um, but uh, uh, that's certainly not true with young people. But I don't think I, I don't see there being any technical solution. You, know, you take this and you'll be fine. I, I, I don't think that's likely to, to ever to be the case. What's your view of well, it's, it's slightly ambivalent because I used to see lots of people who obviously had benefited from Alcoholics Anonymous and that kind of thing. Uh, and obviously it seemed to me that, uh, uh, that I, I would never stop anyone uh, going to Alcoholics Anonymous if it helped them and would encourage some kinds of people to go, even though I think that the heart of Alcoholics uh, Anonymous's doctrine there's a kind of an intellectual inconsistency. On the one hand, it's an illness and it's something you can't deal with on your own. And on the other hand, it's a kind of, you're cured by a kind of inspiration. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't obviously point out to people the contradiction uh, because it's more important 
in my view, that they should not drink than that they should be intellectually 100% consistent. <laughs> Yes. And she says, I've got to stop doing this because it's just another form of addiction. Yes. Did everyone hear that, actually? Yes. Yes? No. C-spanned. Uh, well, uh, the question is that uh, whether there are such, uh, whether people uh, who give up one addiction really take up something else and, uh, it, it, and become, in effect, addicted to it. Um, first of all, I, di I don't really like the expansion of uh, addiction to the uh, uh, to the uh, repeated uh, to repeated behavior because I'm addicted to breakfast you know on that <laughs> on that basis <laughs> uh, so uh, but uh, uh, if it were, even if it were the case, it would be a question of which uh, addiction was more uh, damaging to a person and to, the, of course, the people around that person. It is certainly true that I've met uh, uh, people who have succeeded in stopping uh, taking alcohol who go to Alcoholics Anonymous, but they go, um, you know, 15 times a week. Um, but still, it's better than causing chaos around them. I recently came back from a family program at an extraordinarily expensive rehabilitation uh, facility in Tucson, Arizona. And a couple of things struck me. It was, was mostly focused on young people. First of all, over a third of the patients were British upper class uh, moneyed people who claimed that they were not understood in the United Kingdom. but this industry existed in the United States that catered to their need because they had dual, di dual disorders stemming from uh, anxiety and depression. The second thing was that the other people, the Americans in the, involved in the program, the young Americans involved in the program, were, to, to, to go back to uh, Tom's wonderful phrase, masters and mistresses of the universe. These were not the poor and the disenfranchised. These were rich, successful, young lawyers, young bankers, um, people who I would reckon that a lot of people in this room would know. Um, and, and I guess my question goes back to what jo Joe was saying, is obviously this is an opiate, and we're talking more about cocaine than, than et cetera. And, and I'm wondering, you know, you can't explain this away in terms of lack of hope because these people had everything to hope for mm -hmm. and to inherit and are, are engaged in this struggle. And I'm wondering how much that the, the industry that has grown up around them is encouraging them to continue in this and to suggest to them that it's something they doesn't take character, character and fortitude to overcome but that, they, that the help provided by society through other pharmacological uh, methods, etc. And I just wanted to comment on that extremely yeah. complicated question. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, the, my first comment would be, of course, that I, uh, I don't think existential problems just go away with money. And, um, uh, and if they did, you know, Norway would be paradise. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I see no contradiction, actually, in uh, very rich people uh, being addicted or taking large quantities of drugs. So that's the first thing. Uh, I th my own view is that the idea that there is a technical solution does reinforce uh, the uh, people in their behavior. Because what, one of the things that happens is that they say, well, I haven't received the uh, correct treatment yet. If only I received the correct treatment, I would give up. But since I haven't, I've got no choice but to continue. And that has been said to me on innumerable occasions uh, by, uh, by addicts in, in, in prison. I would give up, but I haven't had the help. And then you say, well, what help is it that you think you need? Um, 
So, uh, again, I think we are here with the, uh, if you like, there's a kind of contradiction. If, if these institutions that you've been help these people to stop, I haven't got really anything against them, provided we don't think that they're helping them through some kind of technical uh, means. But I certainly wouldn't accept that people born to great wealth uh, are incapable of having existential problems. On the contrary, uh, I, c I can see, uh, I can see uh, problems for every kind of person because these existential problems are with, in effect, everybody. We all have them. At least, I... <laughs> yes. um, Hands up those who don't have any existential problem. <laughs> All right, well, tell me what the meaning of life is then. <laughs> so, doctor, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, I have to say, I admire certain parts about your talk. I think that the way you talked about the... Uh, overselling of this notion of the monstrosity of addiction and all these highly dramatized things is exactly right. And when you talk about a, a drug treatment industry that has become obsessed with its own profit making and lost sight of everything else, I think that's on point as well. And the same thing also with the kind of existential suffering that cuts across all classes. But I think you also make three very basic flaws in the argument that you're putting out there. The first one is that there's this wide body of evidence out there from around the world now on the efficacy of things like methadone relative to heroin or even prescribing pharmaceutical heroin or buprenorphine. You know, nicotine patches and what have you for cigarette addiction. You didn't really answer his question there about cigarettes, you know, trying to quit cigarettes may be like having a flu, but why is it that tens of millions of people still can't seem to do it and it doesn't have relevance for heroin? And instead of looking at the evidence, you hold up, you know, one of the world's great totalitarian mass murderers and go, well, look, here's the silver lining on mass murder. He scared a lot of heroin addicts off of using heroin. So I think that's the first flaw. The second one is that you paint with a broad brush about addiction and addicts in a way that is not just accurate about some, and certainly about the subsets maybe that you saw coming into your prison. But beyond that, you engage in a form of demonization and dehumanization about this, saying things that are, if you had a hundred different drug addicts sitting in this room would not apply to over, probably a majority of them, which would be outlandish, but the, the implications of what you say are to suggest the most horrific types of draconian policies. And then finally, to the extent that there's really merit in your argument there, to the extent you make the argument that addiction has been portrayed as being far worse than in fact it is, to the extent you make the point that addiction flows from criminality, not the other way around, it seems to me you've laid out one of the strongest arguments possible for why we should move in the direction of decriminalization and legal regulation of these drugs. If criminality leads to addiction, then can we assume that, in fact, most people who are not criminals will not be drawn to addiction? And conversely, if it's not all that dangerous, then what exactly do we really have to fear? Ethan Edelman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the, the best way to get uh, criminality out of the way is to decriminalize criminality. <laughs> uh, it's not, <laughs> um, uh, now, let me, uh, let me uh, talk about the, uh, metho the methadone and substitution. It seems to me, it, it is quite true, of course, that there has been uh, a lot of evidence that if you give methadone to to addicts, they reduce their consumption of heroin, for example, and um, and and actually uh, start to behave uh, slightly less antisocially. I say only slightly less because they don't they don't stop being antisocial. However, it is also true that if you gave money to burglars, uh, they would stop burgling. And furthermore, there would be a dose-response uh, relationship. So the more money you gave them, the longer they'd stop burgling. But money is not a treatment of the disease of burgling. And furthermore, of course, uh, methadone exerts a kind of tranquilizing effect for a long time, which, uh, which heroin doesn't, which may explain some of the difference. Furthermore, uh, the, I, the, the studies which show this kind of reduction in uh, antisocial behavior and also 
also um, uh, intake of heroin um, are flawed anyway for a very obvious reason. It does not follow from the fact that in a cohort of people who are given uh, methadone uh, and reduce their uh, intake of heroin, that the total number of addicts falls in a society for a very obvious reason. If you are a heroin dealer and I'm your customer and I say, well, thanks very much, I'm taking methadone now, what do you do with the heroin that you have actually imported and got? You go and find somebody else to take it. In other words, giving methadone is not like the treatment of tuberculosis. When you treat someone for tuberculosis, it's an, of course a contagious disease, you not only treat that person, you are interrupting the spread of tuberculosis. This is not the same with methadone. And therefore, and I say that actually the expansion of drug services fits what I'm saying much, and the epidemiology fits much better that kind of thought than that uh, we are, by giving methadone, interrupting uh, and stopping uh, the spread of heroin. Because actually, the increase in methadone uh, usage in Britain just goes pari passu with the increase in the numbers of people taking heroin. So I don't think any study on an individual group of addicts will demonstrate the uh, benefits claimed for it. And as I said, certainly in Britain, uh, the, uh, uh, the studies show that their level of criminality remains extremely high, even if it's less high than it was uh, before they were over-sedated with methadone. And methadone, of course, does actually have drawbacks because it's, it, it is really a moot point as to whether it saves lives or kills people. Uh, because large numbers of people uh, die from methadone. You made uh, one further, uh, there was, you made three points. Demonization. demonization. I don't think I'm demonizing them at all. On the contrary, I'm treating them, I, I'm, uh, uh, I think of them as agents. And I can tell you that my relations with the drug addicts, I won't actually say that they always loved me, that would be going a little far. <laughs> and I was known as Dr. No in the prison. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think in the end I had their respect because w one very simple thing that I saw was they would come into me doubled up in pain, screaming and so on. What they didn't know is that I'd observed them in the waiting room just before I used to go and do this when their behavior was completely different. Now why is it that people don't take any notice of this this kind of observation which has actually been made over and over and over again. So I don't demonize them. I just, I, I think I'm truthful with them. Let's end with a question from Tom. I, I, only, <clears throat> I only dare use this microphone a second time because it just occurred to me that at this very same rostrum recently, Mr. Charles Murray, who is a statistician as well as a sociologist, um, suggested that the United States cease all money transfers for things like Medicare, welfare, drug treatment, um, every transfer. And get, instead, get each person 21 years old or over $10,000 a year. Uh, I know it's taxable or not, but um, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> I think it's a minor matter. In, in what's, uh, uh, now, obviously, it does two things right off the bat. It makes people, it reduces the divorce rate because you're liable to be losing half of your uh, income. Uh, it also reduces uh, immigration because those who immigrate uh, without the desire to work won't do it. But what would it, it possibly is the cure for a drug addiction? Um, you get your twenty, you get your ten thousand dollars a year, um, and if you get married. There's 20, you have to scratch out another five or 10 and you, you, can, you can quite get along. Anyway, it's just because Mr. Murray uh, thought of the idea, I thought it sounded sound you Well, uh, um, it doesn't sound a terribly good idea to me. <laughs> uh, 
And I don't think it will address the problems that I'm uh, talking about because, I'm, in fact, de facto, all the young people who are taking uh, drugs do get. And it, I mean, maybe they don't get $10,000 a year. I don't know what the, uh, what the uh, income they do get, but they do get an income because most of them are unemployed. And in Britain, anyway, they get Social Security. Hmm? Well, they, but they get $10,000 instead just for drawing breath, which is the same as Social Security, isn't it? I mean, what's the difference? I don't get the difference. Yeah, well, that's the same with Social Security. Oh, you mean, it, you mean if, if they become drug addict, if, if they turn out there's a penalty for them, if they, if they spend their money on drugs, then, uh, then the money is withdrawn from them? or. Who shall decide when doctors disagree? <laughs> and at this point, thank you all for joining us.